On this week at Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Brian Chi, Mr. Curtis Franklin here today. Now, we talked about ISPs expanding their networks. Unfortunately, AT&T has announced delays to 500,000 fiber to home builds due to fiber shortages. We'll definitely discuss what that means. Plus, sticking with the theme of cryptocurrency and fraud, because definitely trending in this week's news. Today, we have Brittany Allen, trust and safety architect from SIFT, and she's going to take us through the current climate and how open forums like Reddit and Telegram are being used and targeted by fraudsters. Shouldn't miss it. Quiet on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 456, recorded August 13th, 2021. Sifting the Security Sandbox. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike harnesses the power of every click, every action, and every ally to grow stronger and stop cyber threats before they can stop you. Join the fight and experience the power of Falcon Platform for free today at CrowdStrike.com slash twit. And by Andava. Subscribe and listen to Tech Reimagine, the podcast from Andava, from wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that's dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Maresca, your guide through this big world of the enterprise. But I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, and my very own friends as well. He's not only our network and security expert, but he's also the geek, all-around geek of technology. He's Mr. Brian Chee. Chebert, how are you, my friend, and how's your week going? I'm a little sleep deprived. I had roofers pounding on my roof, put it, putting on the new, um, you know, pulling off the roof and, you know, putting all the things on at 7.15 a.m. this morning. Lots of fun. But, you know, it's the mad race because they're trying to get a new standing seam metal roof up on the house before the storm hits. So more power to them. I'm not complaining. Indeed, indeed. Well, good luck with that. Well, speaking of lack of sleep, he's a happy traveler. He's also an enterprise security expert and a senior analyst at Omdia, and he's the happy traveler. Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, how is your uh, traveling adventures going? Well, last week, the travel was interesting. I was out in Las Vegas at both Black Hat and DEF CON. I came home and got a few days' work done, and now I am at Megacon. Now, this is not a computer industry show. This is a comic and anime convention, a very big one as it turns out. But I'm here in support of the Maker Effects Foundation. Uh, it's the group that oversees my makerspace and also supports STEM education throughout Central Florida. So we're having a grand time. Um, I've worked with words for a long time, and I don't have the words to describe the collection of individuals that are passing in front of me right now. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. We'll definitely have to get some footage of that eight-foot Pikachu when you get a chance uh, so we can see some of that. <laughs> have a good trip back. Well, folks, it's been quite the week in the enterprise, so we should definitely get started. Now, we've talked about ISPs expanding their networks. Unfortunately, at t has announced delays to 500 thousand fiber to home builds due to a severe fiber shortage we'll definitely discuss what that means plus sticking with the theme of cryptocurrency trading as it continues to gain momentum because we're going to talk about it a lot today today we have Brittany allen a trust and safety architect with sift and she's going to take us through the current climate and how open forums like reddit and telegram are being used and targeted by fraudsters definitely some interesting conversations you're going to have there but first like we always do let's go ahead and jump into this week's news blips now, there seems to be a theme in this week's enterprise news. Lots of going on in the world of cryptocurrency. Now, fortunately, mostly things are bad. That's right. A threat research team has discovered malware that not only hijacks vulnerable Nix-based servers and uses them to mine cryptocurrency, but actually modifies their CPU configurations in a plan to increase mining performance at the cost of performance and other applications on the server. Now, the perpetuators use a Golang 
based worm to exploit known vulnerable known vulnerabilities like CVE 2020-14-AA2, the Oracle Web Logic, and CVE 2017-11610 supervisor now to gain access to the Linux systems. Now, once they hijack a machine, they use model specific registers or MSRs to disable the hardware prefetcher, a unit that actually pre prefetches or fetches data and instructions from the memory into the L2 cache before they're actually needed. Now, prefetching has been used for many years and it can boost performance in various different tasks. However, disable, disabling it can actually increase mining performance in an XR, uh, XMR rig by 15%. But disabling the hardware prefetcher actually lowers performance in legitimate other applications on the host. Now, in turn, server operators either have to buy additional machines to meet their performance requirements or increase power limits for existing hardware. And in either case, they increase power consumption and spend additional money. Now, the botnet has been reported since in use since December 2020 and targeted vulnerabilities in MySQL, Tomcat, Oracle WebLogic, and Jenkins, which indicates that it's flexible enough to attack various programs. Now, if you're running on-premise data servers, do yourself a favor, monitor the power metrics of your servers. And if it starts to draw unnecessary power on your application performance degrades at any point in time, it's a hint that you have hardware problems or you might just have some malware. Google this week announced its latest aid for developers, a tool that automates security tasks and checks project attributes to ensure that the security of an open source project has not changed. Dubbed All Stars, the tool uses the GitHub API to check the current state of the project, development branch settings, and other attributes to ensure that critical aspects of the project have not changed. Along with another Google tool called Scorecard, All-Stars assures project maintainers that their security settings remain correct. According to Jeff Mendoza, engineering lead on All-Star for Google, Scorecard measures projects on 18 different criteria, such as whether they're activity, actively maintained, whether they automatically update dependencies, or whether they use a fuzzing system to discover easy-to-find vulnerabilities. Google released the tool this week under the offices of the Open Software Security Foundation, or OpenSSF, which will maintain an all-star instance that anyone can install and use, according to the OpenSSF announcement. The software continuously checks a GitHub repository against its expected state to find any changes that could impact security. The settings of the repository, development branches, and workflows are checked against the public security and settings and policies do not match, the software can undertake enforcement actions. Paired with Scorecard, the new All-Stars tools give developers a way to monitor and secure their software project. Developers can run Scorecard on their project to see whether they stand and then create policies that can be automatically checked and monitored by All-Stars. Will the release of simple tools to track the security state of open source software be enough to have a measurable improvement of its security? Mendoza says improving the security of such components is not difficult. It just requires the right tools and for developers to use them. Well, my story is about how the Russians have tried and failed to smear the COVID-19 vaccination campaigns around the planet with a really weak Planet of the Apes meme. Well, Facebook has removed a network of over 308 Russian accounts on Facebook and Instagram after the group ran an unsuccessful campaign described as, quote, a disinformation laundromat, unquote, to smear COVID-19 vaccines in India, Latin America, and to a lesser extent, the United States. Well, Facebook described the campaign's method as sloppy and crude and spammy in a report published this last Tuesday. The social media giant noted that the vast majority of the campaign just fell flat, with most of the network's posts receiving little or no attention. The campaign had two distinct waves, which were linked to regulatory evaluations of vaccines in the targeted areas. The first wave back in November and December of 2020 aimed to spread lies about AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine. The thrust of the campaign was to scare people into thinking the vaccine could turn people into chimpanzees. Oh, spoiler, it doesn't. <laughs> the root of this lie is the fact that the vaccine uses a harmless, non-replicating adenovirus isolated from chimpanzees as a vaccine delivery method. 
Obviously, the virus cannot turn anyone into a chimpanzee. Well, still, to spread this falsehood, the Russians created and spammed anti-vaccine memes using scenes from the 1968 movie Planet of the Apes. Many of the memes were variations of scenes in which advanced ape characters recommend COVID-19 vaccines to human astronaut who is in hibernation while humanity destroyed itself. It's unclear if the Russians ever saw the film. Hmm. The campaign's thousands of posts in this wave got few, if any, likes, and some authentic users mocked the ape memes. Oh, oh, oh this really lame campaign... No, needs to go into public relations curriculum on how not to run an influencer campaign, don't you think? I do, I do. Well, sticking to the cryptocurrency and crypto mining theme, let's talk about heist. That's right, an unusual twist for one of the largest cryptocurrency heists ever, a hacker who stole more than $600 million in tokens from the blockchain-based po- platform Poly Network on Tuesday has sent back a large majority of the stolen funds. That's right. The funds return was just after a slew of cryptocurrency experts and businesses pledged to track the hackers crypto activity on the blockchain. How exactly funds were stolen are still unknown or actually who stole them either. Now transactions publicly stored on the blockchain show an address belonging to Polly's hacker started returning the roughly $610 million in the stolen cryptocurrency assets through several transactions early Wednesday. Now the transactions publicly stored on the blockchain show an address belonging to Polly's hacker started returning those. And the funny part is a seemingly unapologetic hacker has been leaving notes embedded in the numerous transactions, insisting he only infiltrated Polly's network to expose the vulnerability, claiming to be a, quote, hacking for good. And in a four-part Q&A, they called the heist one of the best moments in my life. Now, less than a week ago, SEC Chairman Gary Gensler said booming decentralized financial platforms, also known as DeFi's, deserve more government scrutiny and liken the space to the wild, wild west. According to the to crypto intelligence firm Cypher Trace, more than 75 percent of cryptocurrency hacks this year have been linked to DeFi. Now, I don't know about you, but people getting rich quick off of cryptocurrency might end soon once the government gets involved. Well, folks, that does it for this week's news blips. But before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that's CrowdStrike. Now, you've seen the headlines, and we've talked about it all the time here on Twit. You hear ransomware attack after ransomware attack holding businesses hostage now if you if you can feel like it's only a matter of time before they come for you and you'll have to decide do you pay or do you lose everything but you can have a third option do you defeat your adversaries before the fight even starts good question well with CrowdStrike, you're not only in the battle against ransomware a secure future demands a shared defense that's why CrowdStrike's falcon platform uses a threat graph powered by advanced ai to analyze behavior on your devices servers and cloud workloads to find the threats and stop them in their tracks now their security platform delivers the industry most powerful set of tools to fight today's most sophisticated cyber attacks all delivered via the cloud through a lightweight intelligent agent now forrester study finds falcon complete delivers in fact, 403% return on investment and a 100% confidence there. Now, CrowdStrike harnesses the power of every click, every action, and every ally to grow stronger and stop cyber threats before they can stop you. Now, Falcon Complete stops breaches every hour of every day through expert management, threat hunting, monitoring, and remediation, and it's backed by CrowdStrike's breach prevention warranty. Now, they don't just say it. They guarantee it for Falcon Complete Managed customers who receive a warranty covering up to $1 million in the event of a breach. Terms and conditions apply there. Now, Gartner Magic Quadrant named CrowdStrike a leader for endpoint protection platform for 2021. Join the fight and experience the power of Falcon Platform for free today at CrowdStrike.com slash twit. That's CrowdStrike.com slash twit. CrowdStrike. Because what we've built together is worth defending together. And we thank CrowdStrike for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for this week's News Bites. Now, we've talked about ISPs expanding their networks in the past. Unfortunately, at and has just announced uh, some, some really horrible news about uh, breaking down their 
their expansion due to fiber shortages. Chibert, what, what's going on there? So the reality is fiber is a persnickety product. Let's, let's just call it a, a spade a spade. The system that builds it and stre- literally it's like stretching taffy. Let, let's call it that. You're taking molten glass and you're stretching it. Now, it's a, unfortunately a pretty labor-intensive system. And like many other things during the pandemic, the production of fiber seems to be not quite keeping up with demand. So the story from Ars Technica talks about how AT&T is trying to do 3 million homes this year with fiber to the home, from so to the curb and to the home. Um, but they think because of the shortage, the shortage that they're claiming, they're only going to be able to do about 2.5 million. Now, they don't say who the manufacturer was, but realistically, there's not that many that can do large, large quantities of fiber like this. Um, the ones that are listed in the story are Comscope and Corning. Now, one thing that is also affecting this is the fiber itself is changing. Um, the previously, everybody says, oh, fiber is horribly fragile. You got to make sure you don't tie it in knots. You don't bend it too much. Well, there's a whole bunch of new fiber that is being used. I know by AT&T and a lot of other um, carriers that literally you can tie it in a knot, pull it tight and still expect it to work. And they're using that for what's called GP, G, GPON. Uh, basically, it's a set of fibers that you use splitters, optical splitters, and you drop it off at each residence or apartment, whatever. I actually saw some of this being installed recently, and it works great, but it is much harder to make. And I, I'm i going to guess, and this is strictly me guessing, that that might be what AT&T is complaining about. It hasn't quite caught up. Now, AT&T is a monstrous internet service provider, and they provide a lot of things all over the United States, especially. Now, what it is doing is that the smaller internet service providers are the ones that are hurting the most. Um, When you buy millions of dollars of fiber at once, the manufacturers pay attention to you. If you're only buying a spool that might... cost you all oh, say three four hundred dollars you don't quite have the buying leverage well so this is happening all over and i guess the question really starts becoming um how many people is this really going to affect um with the pandemic more and more people are saying i want better speeds and I think that is what the story is really about. More and more people are saying, I want faster speeds. And the real way to get that is fiber optics. Well, Lou, you're in a new neighborhood and you got lucky. You have fiber to your (laughs) home. Um, But this is not the case in the bulk of America. Uh, One of our other favorite hosts is... uh, Heather Mo Williams, and she's been wanting fiber forever at her little shack next to the lake in Texas, but she's not getting it. Will it happen, especially with the um, Biden administration saying, let's do some more? Don't know. So what would you like to see? This is is more opinion here, um, because AT&T is not obviously going to show us the internal memos. But do you see people you work with wanting fiber? Are people really willing to spend more for the fiber optic speeds? I know you wanted it, but what about the people you work with? It's a good question. I think, you know, one of the reasons why the expansion to fiber in this area, especially, is not necessarily for consumers. It's more for they, they're trying to push more commercial businesses to come to the area. Um, I'm right over the lines here from Massachusetts. And 
um, you know, pretty expensive to work and manage a business in Massachusetts. So they're they're trying to push more businesses down over the line into the Rhode Island area, uh, and that's where uh, fiber is definitely coming into play. It's it's actually, to be honest, it's actually cheaper than things like um, you know, like like the uh, the Comcast and the other uh, you know providers in the area, the Cox uh, fiber option and and cable option. So that's one of the reasons. But a lot of people who are still working remotely, obviously, fiber is the place to go. And especially because Verizon, um, uh, there's some of the other ones, there's Frontier, that are actually providing services, especially gig services, that might be even cheaper than uh, the cable providers or the DSL providers that are out there today. Um, it's a good it's a good place to be for remote workers or working from home. Only because a lot of businesses, they don't actually give you um, they don't actually subsidize or pay for people working remotely uh, and their internet. Um, so again, you know, cutting those costs down because you're obviously using more internet. I know people who tried to pull down. Um, I've talked to an organization recently and that they they basically were trying to work from home and they had to pull down their repository of source code. And the source code was so big by the time they were done, they actually ran over their Comcast limit, um, their consumer limit. So they actually had to buy Comcast Business, which again, you know how I feel about Comcast Business. I think they're evil, um, and 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 now they're stuck in this three-year contract. Uh, but if they were to have something like a Verizon Fires or a Frontier, there is no caps, and uh, and it's a lot cheaper. So I think that that's where the push should be for more fiber is the fact that we're gain, gaining increased speeds but decreasing costs and bringing industry in, and I think that's where it needs to go. Yeah, and what's fun is. Um I was actually involved with a wireless internet service provider in Honolulu, and we we're using a product um, that allowed us to run at the 60 gigahertz, so unlicensed, uh, relatively short. We're only talking maybe a couple of one to one to three miles, depending on um, um, your line of sight and so forth. But the cool thing is, is with a wireless system like that, we were able to have a 10 gig backbone. And then from there, we'd go and put smaller um, premise units to give you gig to your home. And all you did was bolt this little antenna doodad on your uh, roof eaves and point it in the direction of our main antenna. Well, that is actually part of the Facebook Terragraph system, which is starting to get more and more traction. Um, but... It's slow to come out only because of tower space. So there's some interesting changes in the wind. Uh, SpaceX, obviously, um, they're not going to be in the same kind of uh, bandwidth range as the big guys like AT&T and Verizon and so forth. Um, but we're going to start see seeing some interesting things. Now, one of the other things that I'm going to bring up just because is there's an awful lot of older fiber, especially in major metropolitan areas. Now, conduit space, um, you may or may not know, is really expensive. And the cost of trenching is obscene. So what a lot of cities have done is they've invested in conduit space specifically for communications and to do metropolitan area networks. Now, what's happening that behind the scenes is a lot of this metro fiber is getting yanked out for the new fiber to get longer distances without having to have repeaters. And that's something interesting. Now, the areas that are this is happening in really and truly start hitting the budget pocketbooks of the C-suite in large corporations. Lots and lots of people talk about it. And I know Kurt has had some conversations as an analyst about metropolitan area networks and larger corporations leveraging that more and more and driving the need for more fiber or better fiber. So Kurt, let's go and have a comment on that. What kinds of things have you been hearing about as you talk to the C-suite? Well, obviously, you're right. The C-suite is looking for better connectivity, bigger pipes, and for those bigger pipes to go to more locations. No question about any of that. But it's interesting because this story actually feeds directly into something that I heard about a lot last week at Black Hat. And that is 
supply chain security. You know, it's very easy for us to say, boy, we want bigger bandwidth in more places. But even where the will is there, even where the money is available to put the greater bandwidth in place, you can have something like this supply chain issue that slows it down. Now, this is one of the reasons why increasing bandwidth on a very wide scale around the United States is going to be a difficult problem entirely apart from things like the our supply chain are very fast and very brittle. And all it takes is one problem, in this case, a lack of the raw uh, supplies to make fiber to bring the entire thing to a screeching. Okay, well, sadly, LTE is not up to the task today, and uh, poor Kurt has turned into a Cylon. Ooh. Anyway, the reality is, is fiber is a changing, and more and more people want it, not just uh, cons not just regular Joe Schmo consumers, but corporations are asking for more and more fiber, more and more bandwidth. Now, here's one thing that I want to toss out there. One of the things that a lot of power companies do is they can actually run high voltage, I mean really high voltage power lines with fiber optics in the center. And what happens is the um, in Honolulu, we had Hawaiian Electric running and leasing out dark fiber. And Bank of Hawaii took advantage of this to go from their main data center out by the airport to the corporate tower in the downtown financial district. Well, sadly, the Public Utilities Commission didn't allow that. Now, if, though, if that changes, that could make life really, really interesting for, the, for corporate America. And I'd like to see that. Um, so, just a real quick summary. We've got some changes. The fiber optics from AT&T, they're, they're just trying to go and capture more and more of the uh, consumers. You know, that's, that's expected. But we're also getting upgrades in the metropolitan area networks as far as upgrading the fiber optics. I know a lot of corporations are doing this already because... Upgrading means I can use better, faster optics and, in general, spend less money. And then, of course, Facebook Terragraph is starting to happen. And, you know, this is going to be really interesting, especially once wireless Internet service providers start taking advantage of the Biden administration money for extending into rural America. I'm going to predict that Fiber optic sales are only going to go up, and I'm hoping and praying that folks like Comscope and Corning can catch up. But anyway, I think it's about time for us to start thinking about going to our guests. What do you think, Lou? Indeed it is. Indeed it is. But before we get to our guests, we do have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Andava. Now, Season 2 of Andava's podcast, Tech Reimagined, is out now, now, Tech Reimagined brings together leading tech personalities and industry experts such as Guy Kawasaki, Mary Williams, Alex Hunter, Ma Brian McBride, Tom Gruber, Dave Coplin, Inma Martinez, Viola Llewellyn, and many, many more. Now, the podcast discusses the big questions around technology and its industries. Now, guests and hosts will be take, talking about how these trends impact our everyday lives and how our relationship with technology is constantly being reimagined. Now, check out the episodes Insurance Reimagined Parts 1 and 2, where guests Ann Norklet and Kevin Crawford discuss the role of IT and how it plays in the industry for insurance. Or the two episodes about the role of AI reimagined. Now, Boris Sergal and Radu Orgadon talk about the regulations, accountability, and expectations that arise when using AI to solve complex problems. Now, they discuss what the future holds for this technology and for the individuals who are using it on a daily basis. Interested in shopping? We'll catch parts one and two of our shopping experience reimagined with guests Thomas Beechin and Jeremy Mays, where they dive into some of the most significant shifts they've seen in customer behavior over the last 12 months, including the increasing popularity of direct-to-consumer and buy online, pick up and store, and how the shift to digital is pushing people and companies to reimagine 
the way we shop. Now, Indava has been reimagining the relationship between technology and people. Tech Reimagine explores this relationship on a deeper level with a look at the most recent experiences with technology and its experts. Learn more about how tech is becoming so much more in this world that is constantly growing and changing. It's a podcast you don't want to miss. Subscribe and listen to Tech Reimagine, the podcast from Indava, from wherever you get your podcasts. And we thank Indava for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twire Riot. And today we have Brittany Allen. She's a trust and safety architect at Shift. Welcome to the show, Brittany. Hi there. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for being here. Well, now, before we get started, because we have a lot of fun stuff to talk about here, we, we don't talk a lot about fraud on the show. And we want to get into the details here. But before we get to that, our audience loves to hear people's origin stories. Can maybe take us through a short journey through tech and what brought you to SIFT? Absolutely. And I am going to have to make sure that that is a short journey because nobody takes a straight line to fraud prevention <laughs> when they make that their career, because it's not really something you go to school for. There's no degree for it. Uh, me personally, I ended up getting a degree in history education and in the German language. And I was a licensed high school history teacher until the economic crash in 2008 and nine or so. Uh, bad memories there, made me be laid off and seek a new career. And I ended up getting into the startup world and found a love for trust and safety. So I've spent the past decade or so working for startups, including Etsy, where I got my first exposure to many, many different types of frauds, some of which we'll be discussing today. Then I worked at Airbnb, which added that element of people interacting in person when it comes to a potential conflict. Then I spent a long time at First Dibs, which is a luxury marketplace. So if you want to talk about what it takes to keep a, let's say, $200,000 bracelet safe and away from fraudsters, I can speak to that. And then I worked for a secondhand platform called Let Go. And now I am at SIFT, which is a fraud prevention solution where I can take all of that experience that I've made over the past 10 years and then apply it to other merchants who are looking to learn and to really ramp up their fraud prevention efforts. So it's definitely not a straight line, but you'll hear stories like that all over the industry. I've hired people who were art majors, journalists in the army. It, it really can be anyone who has that love of research and uh, policy. That's a fantastic story. It's very cool. Now, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, fraud and, and, and fraud prevention. Now, we, we know fraud is prevalent on the dark web. It's been there for a long time, but we're starting to see a leak more into the consumer spaces. Can you maybe take us through what's going on there and what you're seeing? Absolutely. So when it comes to fraud on the dark web, you need a little bit more than just a device that can access the internet to get there. You need to have a specific software configuration, whether that is you using a VPN, using a Tor browser to access a site that you already know exists because there is no search index within the dark web, maybe even needing an invite from other fraudsters who can let you into a forum that you would otherwise not be able to access. But that's not going to be something that obviously works for everyone who is willing to participate in the fraud economy or to commit fraud. And we'll see the activity from those sort of entry level fraudsters cropping up on surface web websites like Reddit that you mentioned earlier, and also within some sort of deep web levels of messaging apps that maybe require a little bit more effort, but are still something that is it's very easy to access if you know what you want to look for. And what you're looking for, for what we've been monitoring most recently, can be anything from bypassing identity checks to buy cryptocurrency and not report it to the IRS, or to get free food delivered to your house, or food at a very, very, very high discount delivered to your house, which really took off in popularity during the pandemic, as you can imagine. Yeah, so that's fairly interesting. So obviously, we talked. You talked a little about uh, like the the encrypted messaging platforms like Telegram. Um, you know, but how do you bring in people into that relationship? Because obviously, Telegram is not like an open form where you can go to like Reddit. Now, Reddit is interesting to me as well. We should get into that as well because it's it's basically hiding in plain sight. You're posting in plain sight. You're interacting in plain sight. But with Telegram, you're kind of an encrypted. Uh, uh, platform. How does how does things get started there, and what you're seeing? What are you seeing from the Telegram platform? 
Honestly, it's some of that encryption and that focus on privacy that Telegram has that makes the fraudsters within those Telegram groups and channels uh, comfortable being out in the open. Some of the channels that we monitor have names like Fraud University and Fraud World and um, one that's relevant to the cryptocurrency discussion, Bitcoin Bandits. That's a great one when I see that one pop up on the device that I use to access Telegram, which is not my work computer. I'm not allowed to do that. Anyway, so when you know that they're able to be kind of that out in the open, it's really the fact that they think this is a privacy focused app. There's encryption on my messages. We can even send messages that will self-destruct after they're read, or we could do voice chat, which is a function that Telegram recently launched that is you know, not recorded, no record there, but a lot of fraud happens within those live voice chats. Then it is actually really attractive. Uh, the fraudsters who are starting out on Reddit will see some questions that pop up where they're curious about how somebody's getting something. I saw one, for example, on the subreddit illegal life pro tips, oh, wait, legal pro life tips. There we go. Uh, <laughs> not that I'm trying to direct anyone on how to find it. I should have left that wrong. But anyway, there was a guy asking there, like, how did my friend get all of this food for basically free? And someone just wrote, look at this group on Telegram. Now, if that person can then figure out those extra steps to download Telegram on their phone and find those groups, Telegram actually does have a global search. And if they type in the word uh, food delivery or if they type in fraud, they are going to be able to surface some of those groups to get the ball rolling. And then a lot of smaller channels, including ones that are private, invite only, or that you have to pay to join, will post links within those bigger public channels. So honestly, just with a, a very small amount of effort, way less effort, than to access the dark web, there are you know there are ways to get on there and to still find those those conversations. Now, how long do those live? Obviously, you said they're you know people anybody can get into them and anybody could eventually you know based whether they pay or not get into these these private channels and 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 find ways to get free food and so on and so forth. But how long do those things kind of live? They'll live long enough to impact the companies that they're impacting, and then they go away, or they live pretty long because the the, the way that this is done is still fairly uh, private. Yeah, so the channels themselves live for pretty long. We've been monitoring them for over a year at this point, and I've only seen a very small handful close. No way if I can uh, tell if those were voluntary closures, because sometimes a fraudster will shut down their own channel. They just don't want to do it anymore. Or if those were closures that were initiated by Telegram. We do see a couple of channels get blocked that they are then not able to be viewed on instances of the app downloaded via the Google Play Store, but they're still available on on other instances. So there, there kind of is a tiered level there of potential restriction for the, the channels. But what we do see changing rapidly would be strategies to take advantage of particular companies. So a food delivery company, for example, it's a great example to keep going back to. They may have a strategy for getting orders with stolen credit cards successfully through that company's ordering process or checkout flow. And then that company realizes they're having a big fraud attack. They change their tactics on you know, order review or on fraud prevention, and suddenly that well dries up for the fraudster. We'll see them take a step back and then repost, you know, this company is back up and actually celebrate that they found a way back through because they're constantly testing what methods merchants are using to uh, to keep fraud off their platform to the point where we'll see walkthroughs, uh, methods that are written out. Things are called fraud Bibles that have very robust documentation on how to take advantage of a particular website. And we'll see those just go line by line about what you need to do to commit fraud. Um, I see what you're scrolling past there. I don't know if you wanted to look, talk about that video or talk about the identity bypass with uh, cryptocurrency, but yeah, that's what absolutely. everyone just think, saw. <laughs> yeah, we should definitely talk about that because that's that's an interesting topic here. I do want to talk about just really quickly before we get to that, um, the fact that obviously the pandemic has kind of pushed um, this is a little bit more forward. A lot more people working from home. A lot more people don't are out of the job, um, and and obviously more. We've seen an increase in fraud. What are you seeing uh, as trends uh, from that perspective during the pandemic? And what has changed? What are what are people doing more of or, or less of during that during that time? 
For something people are doing more of, it's absolutely buying online. And that means a huge increase of traffic of online orders that fraudsters were able to hide their activity in. And also people started making very sort of strange or unpredictable purchase patterns. Like maybe you weren't the kind of person who would go online to a major retailer and buy, you know, 10 uh 12 packs of toilet paper, but you did because you were panic buying at the beginning of the pandemic. And that kind of odd change in consumer behavior made it more difficult for those merchants to find the fraudsters who also have atypical or abnormal purchase patterns when compared to a you know normal quote unquote good or known customer. So that was a huge impact. And then also as far as things that decreased when we saw travel and events decrease in their volumes, fraudsters still found a way to take advantage of that. So while you and I weren't going to concerts and we weren't flying or staying in hotels, fraudsters knew that. And we saw on the markets that resell stolen account credentials, focus on uh, airline credentials or on hotel credentials that had high amounts of loyalty points within them, such as frequent flyer miles or whatever points you would get through your hotel program. And the fraudsters were selling those in advance so that they could go ahead, log into them now and establish that new IP address, that new device or whatever that new activity was, and then age the account lay in wait to be able to use them when that travel reopened and when that activity took back off. So we saw them working both sides of, of that angle. They're very perceptive to what the current you know, economic trends are or user behaviors are, and they respond to those very quickly. Impressive, impressive. Now you, we did uh, allude to before. Like, we were seeing a little bit of, a, of the article that you, that, you, that was published there around identity management. So a lot, a lot of these organizations uh, and companies out there, they're using ways to ensure that the user who is buying something or purchasing something is the, the right user. Is that is IDing that right user? Whether they're using biometrics or some other mechanism, how are these fraudsters getting beyond beyond this? And what technology are they using? Yeah, so when you're looking at the sort of you know low level chatter on Reddit, you may see people who are asking about cryptocurrency exchanges that do not require KYC because they're just looking to avoid it entirely. But when you start to get to the more sophisticated fraudsters, you're looking at those who are looking to complete those checks but bypass detection. And in that case, what they are likely doing is verifying a real identity. It's just not there identity. And so they may have a stolen uh, driver's license. They may have a image that they've taken off someone's social media or a selfie that they got otherwise of that person. And they're able to upload that for verification. And if the verification of that cryptocurrency exchange requires something like a live video, they can even go so far as to hire people who are then willing to commit uh, to complete that KYC verification on the behalf of somebody else or another identity. Or they can use something like that video we saw with a digitally created face. We've even seen some uh, videos where the fraudsters are showing off their technology to put other faces on themselves and those that they hire to complete that verification. And it all just comes down to them verifying an identity that has been compromised and stolen. But they, of course, are not verifying their own. And so in the end, they're able to separate themselves from that crime and make away with whatever they found within the account, whatever their target was. Right, right. And just like Verber B. Mike is saying in the chat room, fraudsters will uh, find a way. That's right. They will always find a way around things. Now, I do want to bring Chibert back in. Brian, uh, do you have some questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in asking you to shine up your crystal ball. If you ha could make something happen, what would you do? to try and help fraud go away. You know, the Europeans require PIN, PIN numbers on their credit cards and challenge codes, but the U.S. has been very resistant to that. Um, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you do to try and help fraud go away? Oh, man. Well, if I could either shine up the crystal ball or wave the magic wand, there's a couple of ideas that come to mind. But one of them has to do with actually setting consequences for many of the people who are committing this type of fraud. 
there's really a huge confusion over jurisdictional uh, questions to start with. So when I was a merchant, I worked for a marketplace at one point where we had a high value instance of fraud come through our platform. And I spent days going back and forth between the jurisdictions of where us as a company were located, the state where the card holder who had the fraud committed on their credit card was located, and the state where the person, the fraudster themselves, was located. And none of those jurisdictions knew how to handle it. None of them wanted to take on the case. And the case wasn't so super high value that I could forward it along to some entities that do exist to assist with this kind of investigation. Also, in cases where the merchant is able to stop the fraud and therefore no loss occurs, it becomes difficult to try to get anyone to pay attention and to care about what you're seeing because it wasn't an actual loss. So we don't have anything defined. There's no attempted fraud that is uh, illegal or is, is covered by law. But if it was coming down to something that was technology based as well, then I still think it would go back to whatever those law enforcement uh, entities would be to be able to give them the data that is relevant. Of course, staying within privacy regulations like CCPA and GDPR, but being able to forward that information more easily to an authority who could assist because a merchant who is running a trust and safety team and is already you know, dealing with a high volume of orders that have only increased during the pandemic is really unable able to individually chase down uh, different fraud rings or single fraudsters. Wow. So let, let's go down this uh, road a little bit more. So crypto jacking um, has now been equated by the Department of Justice as terrorism. That might be a little far for fraud, but how do you feel about maybe a uh, us as viewers, our viewers and so forth, us as professionals, let's uh, letter bomb our Congress critters and saying, hey, guys, girls, this has to stop. We're losing way too much money. Too many people are getting hurt. And especially because um, with the pandemic, people have less money. They're le they're, they have less resistance to being able to survive large scale fraud against them. Maybe we need to letter bomb our Congress critters. What do you think? You could even take that a step further than just looking at existing cryptocurrency assets. Some of the chatter that we'll see on Telegram is focused on being able to take over people's bank accounts that just have fiat currency in them, but can be easily attached or are already attached to a cryptocurrency exchange, and then converting the existing funds within that bank account immediately to cryptocurrency. And then, of course, you know, forwarding that to a private wallet going offline, et cetera. So really it goes beyond just that increased participation in cryptocurrency that's taken off. And it can even just affect anybody who has money in a financial institution that links up easily with an exchange. So I'm gonna say it with a little bit more emphasis. Call your Congress critters, tell them enough is enough. Let's go and make some uh, real world consequences. You know, I. I have this old thing. I, I'm an ex-federal uh, employee. I did a lot of uh, crypto work. And uh, we always fantasized that, gee, wouldn't it be great if there were more consequences? And I think that's what we really need to see. And so, everybody, call your Congress critters. We need to something um, do something about it um, as long as it's easy and it's fun to steal from people that are trying to make a living, um, this is bad. And anyway, I want to kind of segue a little bit. Fraudsters are now selling fake vaccine cards. And I was wondering, um, like New York State is now having an app where you have a QR code because New York is talking about actually you have to have a vac be vaccinated to go to all kinds of things. What kinds are you things are you starting to see on the dark web and what kinds of fraud were you talking about in that blog post? So I do live in New York City and I have set up that app, the Excelsior app. 
And again, what it verifies is the name and a bit of the information that the New York Department of Health has access to, that the vaccine information itself is correct, but it doesn't mean that that vaccine information belongs to me. It's not asking for any of my own personal identifying information. It's not doing any kind of two-factor level check there. So what we're seeing for sale on Telegram and other places, even Facebook, are the vaccine cards that have been made that are that are fakes, but are likely using real information from people who maybe posted with a selfie holding the card up to their face or otherwise took a picture of their vaccine card. That information is so readily available and it's what fraudsters can use to easily turn around and make a profit. There was, uh, there's not just one, but there was one uh, Telegram channel that I looked into very carefully and found that they had set up a automated bot so that you don't even have to speak to the fraudster or communicate with a real human to get your fake vaccine card. All you need to do is send the bot your info that is going to go on the card, so a name, a birth date, etc. If you've already got that available, otherwise they can create that for you. You just had to pick that option up front and then send them $200 in a cryptocurrency payment via their preferred payment method. And they said they would ship it out to you via DHL or FedEx, something that would get it to you within just a few days and you would be ready to go. We've seen that not only offered in the US CDC format, but in numerous uh, international formats. And very sadly, we often see it sort of combined with misinformation, which is the way that fraudsters then create that fear and urgency, doubt, that sort of sales tactic to get people to be willing to buy from them. And we do see a lot of that misinformation screenshotted from places like Instagram and Facebook and then reshared on Telegram. Wow. Just, uh, wow. <laughs> That's just <laughs> a bummer. Anyway, you know what? We haven't talked really about SIFT. And I'm thinking, let's toss it back at you. Tell us a little bit about SIFT and, you know, what can, can people hire you to help? And, you know, what does SIFT do? Exactly. Because um, you can't just sit here and bum people out for too much longer. We have to talk about what's actually being done to fight fraud. Uh, so SIFT has been around for about 10 years. We actually had our 10-year anniversary this year. We came out of the Y Combinator summer class in 2011. And we are a fraud prevention company that is a leader in what we call digital trust and safety, which basically means giving companies this unified platform to bring together their teams and tools and to prevent different types of abuse, such as payment fraud that we already talked about with stolen credit cards, account takeover as a result of compromised user info from a data breach, or spam and scams, such as those like pretending to be a government entity to tell people that they could pay to secure their place in a vaccine line, which we all know isn't real and isn't something that actually is uh, possible. So we work with lots of different companies, whether they are retail or crypto or social media, and we basically are then able to help them unlock revenue by not putting friction in front of their good customers. Because as you can imagine, if we put a whole bunch of hoops or hurdles in front of a fraudster and a good customer had to also go through those in order to be able to, to buy something online, that would be really frustrating. So we focus on only showing those those sort of signals around fraud that helps them stop the fraudsters and not inconvenience you know you or me or at least I'm, I'm hoping you guys aren't like weren't furiously taking notes when i was talking earlier about any of these scams i'm sure you're not so <laughs> uh, then then that's safe to say yeah it, it it was an interesting ride when i was working for the federal government i i was allowed to do arrests for certain things and um it was an interesting ride, and I wish I could talk about it, but I can't. Uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Lou, you've been listening. Um, by the way, Lou works for Microsoft, and Microsoft has had a lot of really interesting efforts in anti-fraud. And I'm going to toss the hand grenade over to my buddy over there and say, you know, <laughs> Have you been working with the fraud squad at Microsoft 
or can you talk about that? I unfortunately have not. I do know that there's a lot of different features that are added to different services out there. Obviously, Dynamics 365, the land of Dynamics, where I came from before, before I was in the office team, they have all a ton of uh, uh, fraud protection features built in uh, to their services going forward. Um, so I do know that they continue to, I've, of course, Azure is doing this as well. They're continuing to add services um, that are around fraud detection. Um, so I know there's lots of stuff going on around that. I don't, I don't keep a pulse on a lot of that stuff as well as I'm not privy to that information, but I do know they continue to put forth effort there. But I do want to send this back to Brittany. I want to add another question around um, a SIFT and how they can help organizations. Now, there's a lot of organizations out there, whether it be pharmacies or or um, or retailers. How do they when they when they say, okay, you know, we've started to get hit with a lot more fraud here, um, and it's either on our online system, it's maybe in an in-store um, way of purchasing something, like for instance, the hands-off buying mechanisms. How do they come to you and say, okay, we need your assistance here. Do you have experts there? Yeah. So at that point, it's really about identifying a use case. We will talk one-on-one -on -one with that merchant, see where their pain points are, and then we'll be able to describe whether or not SIFT has a solution for them. Either, like I said, focuses on payments, focuses on user accounts, or focuses on user-generated content. So some of those discussions could actually then help educate the merchant to learn more about the types of fraud they're seeing. We've had that happen before where they believe they have a certain type of attack. And when we take a look at what they are were telling us about, we'll realize it was a different type of fraud and be able to help them out with that because we have seen a lot. My team, the Trust and Safety Architect team, are all former merchants. Uh, so I named my experience at the top of the uh, segment when you introduced me. But we also have people from Facebook, from Google, from Square. So we really are able to provide a good, uh, you know, look into fraud and a lot of education for our users. But it really just, you know, has that one-on-one -on -one discussion where we are, you know, figuring out what their what their pain points are and helping them overcome those. So the interesting thing, I, I actually was privy to um, kind of like a social engineering type fraud. Uh, when I was actually getting one of my vaccines, it was at a retailer, um, it was at a pharmacy. Um, and I noticed that there was a gentleman that kept walking up and back and forth between the front of the, uh, the store and the back of the store. And he would actually get a new vaccine card every time he did that. And some finally somebody called it out and he had already left. And he had probably left with five or six blank cards. So I assume that he's potentially going to go sell those or give those out. The question to you is when organizations, they don't necessarily have tech technology that goes along with some of these fraud mechanisms. The root causes are usually process issues or, or, or things that they need to follow when they, when they, uh, when they're, when they're doing things like for instance, vaccines, does the SIFT help with that as well? Is there, does, is there a part of that that's, that's taken care of in your systems? It definitely can be. It all depends on what that merchant's process is. Talking about vaccine cards, for example, maybe they accept proof of vaccine by someone taking a photo of that card and uploading it to the website. Well, we are able to track image hashes and look for unique images. And if we find a pattern where someone is uploading that same picture over and over and over again, that can be an indicator that that is not a you know, trustworthy uh, representation of a you know, vaccination a vaccinated person, that that is not a legitimate uh, upload. So there are patterns within the events and sort of the signals that we see on a website that we're able to build that larger picture out of. So it wouldn't just be that one point, but it would be a lot of, of analysis that looks at, I believe if I remember correctly at this point, it's, it's a, a staggering number. I actually won't quote it because I don't want to get it wrong, but a staggering number of events that we're looking at in real time to be able to make those recommendations to merchants who use SIFT. It's impressive. Now, one thing that the question to go to before we close up here is, you know, obviously a lot of people probably thinking, well, if they're using things like Reddit and Telegram, should Reddit and Telegram be held accountable for them? Um, and can they be? So I want to throw that back to you. What, what is something that um, it, it sounds like if they were held accountable, the, these fraudsters would just move us to another platform. But it, it, it sounds like there's not really an easy way for these type of platforms to be held accountable, is there? It is very difficult to keep up with moderating 
user con generated content at the volumes that it is posted at in 2021. Uh, I mentioned Telegram having that new functionality of voice chat. So that would be monitoring people in you know real time speaking to each other and trying to determine if that conversation was legitimate or not. That's an extremely challenging uh, undertaking that takes massive amounts of data and effort to be able to analyze. And so honestly, when it comes to the standards that those websites set, it's just up to them to set their own policies and to you know, be able to respect the laws that are already existing within the jurisdictions that they operate in. Because there is uh, always the potential that they may be called to testify, that they may be put on the stand as some other larger social media companies have already done. And at that point, they need to be able to explain why they did or did not take certain actions. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here. Unfortunately, all things, good things come to an end. Brittany, thank you so much for being here. Can you, we're running a little low on time, but we did want to give you a chance to maybe tell the folks at home where they can go to learn more about SIFT and maybe how they get started, how their organization gets started. Absolutely. So if you go to SIF's website, we have a very robust blog that includes articles on a lot of the topics that I went over today, some by me, some by other trust and safety architects. We have a lot of resources that will help walk you through what different types of fraud are if you're interested in, in maybe starting a career in fraud prevention even and potentially joining us. Uh, and then we do have our Twitter handle at GetSIFT, which will post some of these things and help keep you up to date about all of the content that we are putting out. Fantastic. Thanks so much for being here. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. So tune your podcast to Twyat. And I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible because uh, it's definitely a team effort. We have the best team on the market. Starting with our very own co-host, I do want to thank Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's our happy traveler. He's now at uh, one of the other cons around the country. But unfortunately, his internet didn't take and keep by the end of the show. So I do want to thank him and appreciate all of his support and all of his work that he does. But I also want to thank our current co-host that's here. He's Mr. Brian Chi. Brian, what's going on for you in the coming weeks and where can people find you? Well, I am uh, uh, basically trying to deal with a headache from being woken up at 7.15 in the morning with roofers pounding on the roof. Um, but I do plan on trying to go and hook up uh, my, wifi, my hi-fi system again. I have this really cool product that's um, basically it looks like thick tape, but it's got conductors in it so that I could just tape it on the wall and paint over it so I could run the speakers uh, for my sound system, which ought to be interesting. Um, sadly, it didn't survive, but there, if you go on to places like Amazon, you can actually look for... Um, the products they've got all kinds of stuff we actually did the doorbell for kurt kurt franklin uh because the old doorbell wires were broken and we couldn't get to them anymore so we just ran this wire tape and life was good but anyway i want to hear from you folks i really do on twitter i am a d v n e t l a b advanced net lab and we we get all kinds of great comments. Oh, there's Cat Bus that I was helping out at MegaCon for a little while. Um, but, you know, we hear from all kinds of people. Um, I am Chibert at twit.tv. Drop me an email. Feel free to. Or better yet, why don't you use Twiet at twit.tv and that hit all the hosts. <clears throat> now, we do have viewers on every single continent. And I think, I think we still have that viewer at McMurdo Sound in Antarctica. So I'm going to keep claiming every continent, at least for a little while. But we've had some great topics. I keep a list of the topics you want. Um, <clears throat> we've had lots of requests for Kubernetes. This was actually our first episode where we started talking about fraud, which is very cool. That actually didn't show up on our wish list but i'll bet you it will now and you know it was a great show and i really appreciate our guest and unfortunately cylon kurt um his lte modem wasn't up to it and you know we'll see him next week definitely thank you chibert well folks we also have to thank 
you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. And we want to make it easy, easy for you to watch and listen to get your enterprise and IT news. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twyatt. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information and the guest information, the links of the stories that we do in the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Get the, get Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice and listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcasts or applications because we're on all of them. So definitely subscribe and support the show. Plus, you may have heard, that's right, Club Twit. It's a members-only ad-free podcast service with a bonus Twit Plus feed that you can, can't get anywhere else, and it's only 7 dollars per month now it's one of my favorite things of the club quit is the exclusive access to the members only discord channel so you know what definitely jump on there it's some fun interesting conversations going on there all the time i definitely love that so definitely join club twit and be part of the new movement right now go to twit.tv slash club club twit now after you subscribe you should definitely impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with a gift of twy because we talk about a lot of fun tech topics on this show and i definitely guarantee they will find it interesting and fun as well now if you've already subscribed and you're available right now at 1 30 p.m pacific on fridays we do the show live that's right we do it live come see how the pizza is made come see the behind the scenes all the fun stuff that we do here on twit at live.twit.tv right on the stream right there come check it out and be part of the show live but if you're going to watch the show live you might as well jump into our live irc channel as well a lot of fun uh, top, a lot of fun characters in that channel and uh, you, you can join them by going to irc.twit dot tv join the fun join the live show now definitely you can hit me up at twitter.com slash lou mm just like cheaper said send us some dms some 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 send us some show ideas that you might have some things you want to hear us do on the show maybe even send us things that you like or dislike we're okay with that as well we love the constructive criticism now if you want to know what I, what i do during my normal work week at microsoft you can definitely check that out as well you can go to developers.microsoft.com slash office there we post all the latest and greatest ways you can customize your office experience to make it more productive for you. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week to do this week at Enterprise Tech, and we definitely couldn't do the show without them. So thank you for all their support. I also think, want to thank all the engineers and staff at Twit. We definitely couldn't do the show without them. And of course, I also want to thank our Mr. Mr. Brian Chi one more time. He's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. That's right. He does all the bookings and the plannings for the show. And we really couldn't do the show without all his support. So thanks again, Chibert, for all of your help and assistance there. And before we sign out, we do have to thank our editor for today. He's Mr. Victor. Victor makes us look good after the fact. He cuts out all the noise and, and all the mess that we that we make during the stream. So thanks so much, Victor, for all your support. And of course, we also thank our technical director at TD today, Mr. Amp Pruitt. He's not only a TD, but he's also a very talented uh, host of one of our a lot of our shows here on Twit. And he does a really fun show about photography. So Amp, what's going on this week uh, on, on, on This Week in Photography? So Today, this week, I was actually doing some uh, listener feedback. We looked at some macro photography because the last couple Ooh. of weeks, macro photography has been the subject at hand. And it was nice to get some feedback from our crew and hands-on photography and take a look at their images. And I critiqued them and I was gentle. I wasn't too harsh on them this time. I love that show. I love that show. And macro photography is a lot of fun. I love doing product photography as well with using macros. Yes. Thanks, Ant. We'll definitely check that out. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Moresco just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you are interested in checking out all things smart home and Internet of Things, then you should check out Smart Tech Today, the podcast I, Micah Sargent, do with my co-host Matthew Casanelli. It's all about the smart home and improving your automations.